So the first question that we have from our audience from the clubhouse session says, given that we now know that we have possibly the youngest Ashulian population from India, what implication does this have on our understanding of dispersal of hominins in the Paleolithic? And I think when we see the age range of these young Ashulian populations at 140 to 120,000 years ago, when we start thinking of that in a wider regional context, well, that's a time frame that we know that there's Homo sapiens in uh, sites in, in the Levant. Um, so that overlaps with uh, Homo sapiens at school, for example. And it's very close in the time frame that we see uh, Homo sapiens appear in a number of records in China. It's also pretty close to the time scale that we see the youngest Homo erectus in Southeast Asia, which I think is now dated to 106,000 years ago. Now, for me, it's kind of incredible because Homo erectus is that population that you know, we almost always attribute a Shulian, the spread of a Shulian technology with. So partly finding a Homo erectus in Southeast Asia nearly 100,000 years ago, you know, that continuity of that one, one population is really out, outstanding. Um, but it also perhaps highlights that not just in Southeast Asia, but also perhaps in South Asia, we're seeing Homo sapiens potentially meeting these populations. Of course, you know, the fossil record that we have from, from South Asia doesn't really give us that enough insight, but some, looking at these time frames, looking at that wider perspective, perhaps suggest if we're seeing the expansion of Homo sapiens around 100,000 years ago, they could have been encountering Homo erectus populations, as well as you know uh, some of the other populations that we know, now know about. We know that they've encountered Neanderthals and Denisovans, but, but who else? And so perhaps that young Acheulean in India suggests that it's a context where they met another population. Hey, thank you so much. Uh, another question we have is. Coming to the Middle Paleolithic, do you see any specific, uh, I'm sorry, does anybody have their mics unmuted? Because that's causing an echo here. Anyway, um, so another question we have is coming to the Middle Paleolithic, do you see any specific raw material dominating the industries in the Thar region? All right, from there's quite a lot of variability, uh, to be honest with you. You do, there are some changes. And I think one of the big differences is actually from the Acheulean, uh, there's, a, there's really only a focus on those materials that occur in large sizes. Um, so you're seeing you know, some of the larger bits, you know, stuff like quartzite, some standstones, um, As we move into the middle Paleolithic, you see a lot of diversity. So, as much as there are, there is a focus. Um, some of that change is actually the real change that you're seeing is that you have populations engaging with a, a much wider range of resources, and notably, some of them are more salacious and often appearing in smaller, smaller sizes. You move into the, the late Paleolithic in the region. And there's almost an exclusive focus on some of these finer grained materials. So focusing on, uh, well, cherts, silicious stuff like jaspers and some of the fine quartzes. So really in terms of raw material use, you have very narrow use of some of the bigger stuff in the Acheulean, the middle Paleolithic, there's a lot of diversification of what people are using. And then in the late Paleolithic, it narrows and centers on some of the most fine grain material, but is almost consistently very small. Right, thank you so much. So the first question we have here in the chat box is by Simran Korseni from UCL. She wants to know that last year there was a discovery of the oldest dated river channel near Bikaner and the deep river deposits at Nal Quarry. Could you elaborate more on its implications on the Paleolithic research in Thar Desert area? Yeah, so what, um... Uh, what uh, we did for that research is that actually, um, as part of my work with Hemarachi Than, we were exploring, we, as she's a geologist and comes more from an environmental approach, and I'm 
I work with Olympic technology. So it's often quite engaging to work with one another in the field and trying to find some of those sites which are going to tell us some new stories. Um, and this is as part of one of our surveys. Uh, it's actually a site where there's quite a large quarry. Um, and we were able to go and investigate these sediments. And what it shows is that there's um, just outside of Bikineer, um, quite deeply stratified. There's you know, 30, 40 meters in the section that we were able to see uh, from seeing quite a lot of the quarry because it was active operation. But there's about 30 or 40 meters of river deposits there, um, which we uh, dated using luminescence and dated that as quite a an energetic and active river in marine isotope stage six. So we had dates and into the start of MIS five. So between about 190 and 100,000 years ago, there's quite an active river going there. And then there's uh, gradually started uh, to become less active. Now this ties up with some remote sensing work that has been done, which has shown that actually there look to be a lot of river channels have crossed the tar desert at some point in the past and then for various reasons have been disrupted. So it's a tectonically active region, so perhaps it was tectonics, um, but there are equally some other other reasons that could change the pattern of fluvial evolution there. Now putting this all together, what it looks like is that at a key time frame for looking at this question of a shooting to middle Paleolithic transition, we have a second river running broadly parallel to the Indus crossing the Tar Desert. And it's a region which where you have, if there's continuity of water supply, it's actually uh, a very, ha very habitable. And in fact, if you look at the modern Indira Gandhi canal, uh, canal there, which as long as, as soon as you bring water that takes water from the modern, modern soot ledge into the region, agriculture is possible. And actually, where there's water leaking from this canal, you have a lot of wildlife and a lot of wild flora. So that makes the Tar Desert perhaps a much more attractive place for hominid populations in MIS 6 and MIS 5 to be. All right, thank you so much. She also wants to know if you could shed some more light on the presence of points in the Middle Paleolithic assemblages and how that has wider implications on indigenous transitions from middle to late Paleolithic in the context of specific environmental changes? So, I mean, I guess there, there was a paper um, by August Costa uh, about a decade ago suggesting that perhaps point technologies weren't uh, a key feature of the middle Paleolithic uh, of South Asia. And he was arguing that perhaps the you know, presence of often closed uh, wooded environments had led to um, that perhaps influencing stone tool technology. But that, looking back at some of the history of research, doesn't quite fit. And even Sankalia uh, in a paper in the 1960s identifying what he called the Middle Stone Age of India identified not just points as being a key feature, but also um, tanged points as well. Um, so, and from what I've seen, and certainly in the Tar Desert, it's the middle Paleolithic is rich in points, whether they're produced through Lavawa technology or through retouching. Now, retouch points do seem to be present in some of the younger uh, late Paleolithic assemblages. Um, I think from my perspective, and particularly this change into the use of backed pieces um, that we see with the late Paleolithic and how we might imagine people were using points, uh, particularly as potentially as part of hafted toolkits, whether we see a change in the use of points at the middle Paleolithic to late Paleolithic transition represented a change in the use of hafted tools. And that's comparable to what we might see in the MSA and LSA of Africa where uh, retouch points are a key feature of the MSA, backed pieces become much more prominent in the LSA. And again, it's where we see, uh, it's assumed to see a shift, perhaps from the use of tools such as spears, for example, 
uh, towards lighter toolkits and such as uses of bows and arrows. So making arrows, stone tool tips might be quite heavy and you could do something much lighter with them using smaller packed pieces. Right, thank you so much. So Dipanshu Shekhar from Delhi University wants to know how should one approach the study of cultural connections across the mid-latitude arid belt to decipher whether tools found at the Katoati are a result of a shared cultural connection with the atrian industries in the Sahara or of convergent evolution of tools? I think, you know, and that's a great question for me. Um, I think that convergence is probably uh, the simpler option here. Um, and what's particularly notable, so the, you know, the Aterian of uh, the Sahara in North Africa is this focus on uh, not just retouched points, but tanged points. And there they're interpreted as features used uh, for hafting. They're particularly prominent in MIS-5. Now we found some examples of tanged points at Katoti and a couple of other sites in the Thar Desert, again, dating to MIS-5. And so some people have made this connection of, ah, oh, perhaps this is, this is the Ethereum. But what's really interesting there is that you don't find these tanged pieces in Arabia or in the Levant, where there's a lot of sites dated to MIS-5, and they're not seen in Iran either. So you've got this big gap from where you do see them in Sahara to where we're seeing them in uh, the Tar Desert. For me, I think that is the first step to suggest that we'd be looking at convergence. And particularly because as an approach to technology, tanging is a functional feature. And in fact, that we see tanged pieces occur in stone tool industries across the world that are show no other particular connections. So you find tank pieces turning up in uh, some of the earliest uh, IUP, so initial upper Paleolithic in Korea, uh, in MIS-3, for example. And there's no need to make that connection, I think, because there's that functional process. If you to look for some of those, perhaps, population continuities, I think it's best to work with those stone tool types where you're less likely to see heavy functional constraints. Um, and that's why I've highlighted Chris Clarkson's work on core technologies as a good way of looking at interregional connectivity. Absolutely. Thank you so much for that. So the next question is from Diptarak Datta from Deccan College, Pune. He says, why do you think it is important to attempt a correlation between episodes of hominin movements and habitations in South Asia and the known MIS data series, especially in the context of South Asian prehistory, where such an approach seems more or less rare? I, mean, I think it's um, I mean, there, what I'd like to tackle is this question of how we talk about time frame, uh, time frames for the Paleolithic in India. And it's something I was trying to address by showing you a figure of you know, different climate archives from the region. And of course, talking about things in marine isotope stages is something which is heavily borrowed, uh, mostly from work in Western Europe, uh, where you see much closer correspondence to some of these high latitude archives, such as like the Greenland ice cores, that really pull out sort of MIS-5 and the last, you know, so MIS-5e in particular and the last glacial maximum really stand out there. Um, but as I've shown, um, actually when we look at some of the, how some of these archives work in the low latitudes, and it's something which is comparable across the low latitudes, is that you have perhaps other patterns coming to the fore. It's not that we don't see these marine isotope stage records having some influence, but they're not as prominent so this is where I've highlighted, I was highlighting in my talk, for example, a phase of particularly prominent uh, monsoonal uh, intensity at the start of MIS-3, much more so than you might expect from the northern latitude, high northern latitude records. Um, 
Where we're kind of stuck though, is the question of the number of dated sites that we have and chronological resolution. So uh, uh, particularly how some of these sites are distributed across, across India, which is huge. So where I still use the marine isotope stages as a means to lump and group things, it's often to cover over these cracks that perhaps we don't have lots of dated sites and you know, where we do have dated sites, they're, they're spread here and there. And we don't always have very detailed local records to fit them in to, okay, with that we see these change changes in Southeast India associated with this peak in monsoonal intensity, which was not apparent at the same time in the West. Um, so I think, yeah, I would definitely how we talk about these things how we link them to environmental patterns, it's important to try and put them into that local context. Um, why use, why I'm still using marine isotope stages as a shorthand, again, it's really just papering over the cracks until we've got enough data that we can resolve something different. Thank you so much. She has another related question, which goes, how do you think this attempt at correlating lithic assemblages with episodes of glacials and interglacials relates to the much older work done by De Terra and Patterson in context of the Suanian assemblages in Shivaliks back in the 1930s. And I think when looking back at some of the older literature, it's astounding how, how well a lot of researchers got uh, you know, the patterns right and the time frame wrong. The, you know, these, the global trends are, are there and you know, of course these were, you know, they're experts in their field, they'll see the patterns and it's just assumed, you know, it was assumed everything happened on a much more compressed time scale uh, than we now know. And that's only because you know, it's the last what, 50, 60, 70 years that we've had the benefit of chronometric dating. Um, so in terms of those patterns, and as an example, also looking at the work of uh, Bridget Olchin's team, Olchin's team in part of her book is still incredibly useful to me because although some of the some of the dates and some of the actual time scales don't quite fit the patterns that you identify, tally very very closely with what we know today. Um, so I think that's how I take how I look at some of these things of recognizing that a lot of the changes and a lot of the, of the context for individual assemblages might be very well interpreted, but actually their relationships to one another and changes through time. Uh, you know, we benefit today through chronometric dating and that can change our perspective. Um, so I'd imagine that would also bring new insight to how we look at sequences such as the Soanian sequence. And again, it'd be fascinating to see quite how, where Terra and Patterson got things right and where they got it wrong. Um, I, my hunch should be they got the patterns right and they just squeezed that time frame down. That's an interesting insight. Thank you so much. So Nidhi Patel from Ferguson today wants to know the earliest South Asians stopped making geometric microliths was there any specific reason for non-geometric forms of lithics? Um, I think, you know, if you look again globally, you almost always see a focus first on, of, as you know, there is a global trend and through time for stone artifacts to get smaller. Um, and when we see, whether in Africa, whether in India, you've tend to see the presence of, of non-geometric microliths. So uh, before you see geometrics turn up. Um, and really, I think it's a question of standardization. That's what the geometrics are really doing, of where you, rather than perhaps working with something which is fits your needs, imagine that you can just produce you know, 10, 20, 30 crescents, and you know that they're going to perfectly replace one small piece of your tool as it breaks. So it's it's almost that, that focus on standardization. You, know, you could see a comparison with uh, a difference between knives and razor blades, for example. They might be able to do the same job, but once you have razor blades, 
made in the same shape in the same way you can take one out and replace it with a new one and you're good to go so i think for me that is where some of that transition is important and thank you so much so the Tarak is back with another question he says in the article discussing the discovery of middle late pleistocene fluvial activity and evidence from the null quarry of central tar you observed the importance of ground truthing the older remote sensing data regarding fluvial activities. What implications would these would, the, would this process of ground truthing have regarding what is known about the prehistorical fluvial activities in the Thar region? Yeah, so I mean, there's in terms of that ground truthing element, we've seen it quite significantly for this question of the Gagrahakra. Now, of course, you know, there's been this big debate about what caused the rise and the fall, and particularly the fall of the Indus civilization. Um, and it's you know, argued to be the fact that you know, it is related to the flow of the Gargahakra River. And to my mind, what's been completely overlooked there is where people have gone to ground truth and look at the activity of this river. It's most prominent, actually, from around 69,000 years ago to around 14,000 years ago. The Gargahakra, for me, is a Paleolithic question. That's when it was this lively river. And that's because people have gone literally to ask these questions of, you know, and it's not to say that it wasn't, it didn't have some activity or some relevance to the Indus civilization, but it's no, it was not that final drawing. Um, and that shows the importance of actually going and looking. Now there's some incredible work that's done with remote sensing stuff. Um, Hector Orengo's team is doing some really complicated and really fantastic stuff, pulling apart the very complex records that you see um, of where we see a lot of those key Indus sites. As we go further back into the past, as we look at these older rivers, they're necessarily, the result is more cut up, it's harder to find, it's older, so it's buried or could have been eroded and some of it being destroyed by things like quarrying. Um, and I think what really stands out also is some of those factors that might change the fluvial landscape. So what we see in uh, around Bikaneer is that the modern drainage basins are currently forced by sand dunes, which would have formed in the last 20 or 30,000 years. We're looking at the much older time frame, of course. But also, there's, as I've mentioned, there's this uh, potential for tectonic activity of these deeper time frames to have really changed those patterns of drainage. So even if you look at uh, lakes such as the Jaisal Mirans, now they actually look like they're tectonically disrupted uh, drainages, which are perhaps part of a former fluvial system. So actually there we've got this comp much more complex picture of trying to find the fluvial deposits to understand when the river was flowing and also trying to pick apart perhaps how these te dynamic tectonic landscapes changed and then ultimately how they've been overprinted by sand dune mobility, particularly in the last 20,000 years. So it's a, in some ways a much more complicated picture to pick apart. Thank you so much. So the next question we have is by Dr. Pat Chohan from Aiza Mohali. Uh, welcome, Dr. Chohan. Would you like to unmute yourself and ask your question, perhaps? Sure. Thank you, Shriya. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, hi, James. How are you? Nice to see your talk. Thank you. I enjoyed it. Uh, my question is uh, basically based on recent uh, discoveries. So I just wanted to know your opinion, if it has changed or still the same. So my question is, uh, considering your proposed association of the Levantine Nubian with Neanderthals, and the recently proposed association of the Middle Paleolithic with uh, the Nesher uh, Ramla Homo, do you still think the Middle Paleolithic evidence you reported from Tar and Kutch uh, belong to Homo sapiens, or should other species also be considered? I, I think, you know, obviously trying to associate um, particular stone tool types and particular industries with a particular population is always complicated. And in a region like India, where we just don't have the fossil basis to do it, it's really hard. Um, the Nubian question, 
ties in quite nicely with that previous question about the Aetherian, where, again, for me, I wonder how much of that really is uh, a question of, you know, different populations coming to the same solution. If you want to make points or certain types of points, you end, there's only certain ways of doing things. Um, and for me, that's where I place, that's where I'd perhaps see that link between Neanderthals and Nubian technology. And again, I've reported stuff similar to Nubian technology in uh, the Tar Desert, which for me, I think fits best as you have limited solutions to make certain tool types. Um, I know obviously the demographic landscape, uh, particularly of you know, more broadly Southern Asia, uh, is, has become really complex. Um, and I think, yeah, could other populations, could another hominin population have taken Middle Paleolithic technology into South Asia and not Homo sapiens? Maybe yes. Um, but I don't think we really have the evidence to resolve that clearly, and at which point I think I come from a position of parsimony that it, the simplest explanation is that we've only had one demographic change in the region rather than trying to necessarily advance another one. Um, I guess you could look more broadly to, again, Chris Clarkson's work, who's made much closer comparisons in terms of core technology from the Jureru Valley, from the Middle Son Valley, with stone tool technologies made by Neanderthals and made by Homo sapiens to show that link. So where he's made perhaps uh, a much more elegant case for that link with Homo sapiens in the Middle Paleolithic in India. Um, I mean, I'm certainly, you know, obviously, particularly with that, you know, presence of difficult to describe hominins in Levant, new hominins uh, turning up in Southeast Asia, things can change. Um, and I'm certainly open to changing my mind on that. But at the moment, I think for me, the simplest expl explanation still seems to be that most of the Middle Paleolithic in India could be explained by an expansion of Homo sapiens. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Chauhan, for coming in. And we have a lot of thank yous coming in for you, Dr. Blinkhorn. A lot of people are very happy to be here. Some of them have heard you speak for the first time and they're very excited. So the next question we have is finally from somebody in MSU Baroda. And just a second. So yes, Divya Saxena wants me to ask you the three questions. The first one says, the Kutch region of Western India has Paleolithic evidence of occupation. Do you think the Kutch would have been a region of coastal adaptations in late Paleolithic period? So again, one of the reasons that I was interested in working in Kutch is that so many we have a number of prominent models that suggest a later human dispersal into India 60,000 years ago went along the coast. And so this is an opportunity for me uh, working that region to try and test this, test this idea. Um, and as I mentioned, because it's tectonically active and because actually the, if you look at the modern bathymetry, so if you look under the sea, it looks like there's a very wide coastal plain in the region, but Marine cores have showed at least 100 meters of that in many places have been deposited in the Holocene. So as a place to look for coastal adaptations, I think Catch is a good place to do it because I think it's very hard to specify how close to the coast it was, but I think it's always been at, uh, one of our best bets for signing, finding somewhere where we've got late Pleistocene deposits in relative proximity to the coastline. That being said, I from what I've seen and from what we see in other regions of the world for what coastal adaptation could mean, there's no evidence of it there presently. So you don't see some of the evidence comparable to what we might see in um, Southern Africa, for example. And there's, there are some reasons why we might not imagine those results to be quite comparable either in terms of uh, the actual productivity of coastal landscapes are very different uh, in the tropics to compare to higher latitudes. 
your meat. Shreya, you're muted. Oh, I'm still muted. There we are. Sorry about that. Thank you so much for that. So the second question by the same person. It's ostrich eggshells have been recovered from Rajasthan, Madhya Pradesh, Maharashtra, and Uttar Pradesh in India. Do these regions also have enough osteological evidence of presence of other megafaunas that can support the view of hominin presence in these regions? No, I mean, I think, again, it's an area in which, uh, you know, one of the reasons that we don't have a great fossil record for hominins is the same for a lot of other animals of our size um, in terms of geologically, some of the context for preservation, they're not really there. Um, so we have to look at some very niche scenarios and the Bill of Sergum Caves at Kurnool, perhaps one of the best ones uh, for being unique as being a limestone cave, so great for preserving bone. But they're few and far between uh, in a lot of India and part of that is rooted in the geology. Um, because you have a lot of acidic you know, volcanics, sandstones, quartzites, these aren't great for preserving fossils over the long term. And so where we do see fossil records uh, for other animals, you know, often they're, they're, you know, they're really big. You know, we're talking about hippos, we're talking about elephants, because the bones are so huge that they can survive long, they're robust enough and last long enough in places. And often they're appearing in places where you find heavy carbonate deposits, such as in the Namada Valley. So that helps their preservation and perhaps there's a size bias there. And that's where the ostrich eggshells are really interesting because they are more robust in themselves in ways that a lot of bone isn't. Um, so in that sense, no, we don't have, uh, you know, we really don't have great formal records to pair uh, with much of this, uh, the changes that we see in stone tool technology either. Um, so it's, Again, it's another difficult part of this puzzle. How do we see perhaps regional patterns of change? It'd be really interesting to see um, how formal communities respond to climate change. And just going back to Bill of Sergum, one of the interesting things there, of course, is that uh, from the 24 taxa that we recorded from a sequence stretching back into MIS 6 uh, all but one of them are present in India somewhere today, but many of them weren't present locally. So it gives this idea that actually you have these mosaics of ecology that are shifting. And it's really constellations of these uh, uh, of ecologies and where they butt together can produce changes. And perhaps this is one of the reasons that uh, yeah, it makes India, a very attractive place for hominin populations. It's not like the Sahara or the Arabian desert belt where you see these huge, this dramatic swing from rainfall of opening up the deserts to aridity killing everything off. Actually, more limited movement would mean that I think there'd always be persistent occupation of the region. Right, thank you so much. Third question also by the same person, and I think you've already answered this, but I'm just going to read it out to you. So middle Paleolithic period in India has key evidence of point technologies in the Thar Desert. Could you please tell us what this indicates in context of the Thar Desert specifically? I think um, there's a couple of different ways to tackle that question. I mean, firstly, you know, what I see more broadly across uh, you know, the South Asian record and broadly across a lot of other Middle Paleolithic or Middle Stone Age records is that point technology seems to be a key thing. It repeatedly occurs with most Middle Paleolithic technologies. Um, so its presence in the Tar Desert Middle Paleolithic for me is just, uh, it appears with Labawa technology and a couple of other things, it's in that sense, helps give us a view of it's quite a classic Middle Paleolithic technology. Um, in terms of some of the appearance, you know, I've talked about uh, you know, presence of tangs or Nubian points. And I think an interesting thing, and perhaps I could have emphasized more, is actually how I see this 
that are there's a, a, such a transitional zone ecologically in terms of climate. You see that shift from deserts into the monsoons. That would be quite a sharp change. You see you know, the resulting impacts on ecology. Again, uh, thinking about questions like hafting. Now, hafting relies on using organic stuff. So if you imagine you're making a, a spear, you need you know, some wood as the shaft. You're going to use a stone for a tip, but often you're using something organic in terms of binding. So whether it could be resins. Um, and some of those resources are going to change as you move into South Asia, even if they're similar sorts of plants, they might not behave in exactly the same way. So that's a, a point of adaptation. And the stone is changing itself. I mean, if you look at the, the Rory Hills, um, so just adjacent to the Indus, it's one of the last large outcrops of chert from the Eurasian plate. And you find this, this is a landscape littered with stone pool technology from the Acheulean uh, all the way through to very recent time frames. You find beautiful chert in so many different sizes, you can do everything with it. Not too far in the tar desert, that disappears. You, you're reliant on much coarser material, sandstones or quartzites maybe, where you do find cherts and jaspers, it's in much smaller sizes. So the, the stone itself is just you cross this landscape. So I'm particularly thinking about stuff like the tank points here. I think this is why I see, you know, this is why people are making a functional choice at this spot is because everything, a lot of other things around them are changing in this landscape. Let's go for something that's most reliable. And tanging is a very reliable way of hafting, um, more so than relying on perhaps your glue technologies to haft or because you can make particularly fine uh, flint tools that perhaps you, you can haft in different ways. So there's a lot changing. I think that is where the point technology is really interesting for me in terms of how populations are adapting to all these different changes. Right, thank you so much. So if I appeared a little distracted for a bit, that was probably because I have questions coming in on the phone as well at the same time. Uh, so another question we have is by Purbasha Mukherjee, also from Delhi University. She says, due to the dynamic tectonic settings of Kutch, a substantial amount of land got submerged underwater during the earthquake in 1819. Do we find any lithic assemblages underwater as a result? And is there a scope for future research underwater in the region in Kutch? I mean, it, you know, it's a very dynamic. Uh, landscape and in fact there's particularly the, uh, you know, the University of Catch and Budge, there's a lot of work there now and particularly after the earthquake uh, at the turn of the millennium looking and trying to put some of this in a chronological framework so that's assisted our work in some ways because they're starting to piece together the region's tectonic history looking at how these fluvial drainages are getting dis disrupted and how they change um, but it means as actually out to sea. Okay. It's a region where occasionally you'll find these moments of uplift where from the sea an island appears and then then it, you know, it sinks perhaps a month later. Um, so partly it's incredibly dynamic in that sense. Um, in terms of the prospects of doing underwater archaeology for some time frames, I think certainly yes. Um, and particularly if you look at the, the rands, so the, you know, uh, the two rounds of catch where they have been submerged even, what, two and a half thousand years ago, it's reported that uh, Alexander the Great's army was able to actually navigate some of these areas by boat. So that's a you know, huge change to what we see them as today as these salt pans or you know, only seasonally uh, underwater. Thinking about getting back to the, the late Pleistocene, however, my word of caution really comes from this fact that some of the marine cores in that area point to huge volumes of sediment uh, that have built up in the last 10,000 years. One of the cores has you know, 100 meters of sediment built up in the Holocene alone. Uh, like the Indus Canyon and the Indus deposits 
again, they're a, they're a complex system of themselves, but seeing how much has been deposited in 10,000 years makes it complicated to imagine what you might need to do to find those spots where that preserves something from 30 or 40,000 years. Absolutely, thank you so much. So Ira Bhatnaga, also from MSU, says, could you talk about the implications of associating a specific lithic assemblage to any particular biological population, which you discussed in your paper on middle paleolithic point technologies in Thar Desert? Well, I mean, again, in answer to past question before, it's, it's very complicated to do that, where perhaps you, know, you need some uh, very rich records to, I think, do it with any sort of confidence. And even then, you know, there's always room for debate um, as to can we truly link a, a biological population with a cultural population. And even when I was talking about how we look at transitions before and thinking about perhaps contact between Neanderthals and Homo sapiens in Europe, well, that's a debate that's been raging back and forth for 50 years with you know, perhaps no sign of conclusion. Um, so it, it's really complicated. And can you do it in a straightforward way? Uh, I don't think so. Um, I think you know, the best way to approach this is you know, thinking about what the alternatives might be and how you might resolve between them. So um, you, know, you can imagine you know, testing, try to identify all the different scenarios in which who might be making these points, who might, you know, again, going back to, to past uh, question, we know that, okay, there's Neanderthals in the landscape, perhaps there's uh, Denisovans, perhaps young Homo erectus, perhaps another population that we don't quite know. There's all these different hominins who could perhaps be using these like, middle paleolithic point technologies and using them in India. Is there a way to resolve between any of them? Not without fossils, unfortunately. Um, and at which point that's where I was saying as going back to parsimony in terms of what is the most simple explanation. We could we can imagine that all four of these populations were in India at some point and made some of the middle paleolithic assemblages, as well as Homo sapiens. But we, the simplest answer is that only one of them did, the one that we know that is there today. Um, but I think more broadly here, there's that question of how much should we be looking at questions purely of let's look at the stone tools and try and link it to a given biological population, rather than trying to consider some of those questions that we should be asking of the archaeological record independently. I think in the Paleolithic, it's where we are often always looking at cheating a little bit by looking at fossil records rather than asking questions about what is promoting cultural evolution as an independent and useful source of information in and of itself. I think that, so this is something I was trying to tackle later on in my talk, thinking about what are these, what features might promote innovation amongst populations? And in some of these, it wouldn't matter which population we're talking about, we'd just be talking about, you know, is it population size, as some people suggest? Is it particular environmental conditions? Is it particular ecological conditions? So we could almost move away from a, too much of a reliance on always trying to pin things on a particular hominin and try and think of actually what promotes cultural change or cultural continuity. And I think those are some important questions and something that we uniquely as archeologists can do as opposed to working as paleoanthropologists. Thank you so much. So Neharika Srivastav says, a great talk. Thank you for this insightful talk. Thank you for coming, Neharika. She's from Deccan College, Pune, and she wants to ask, is there any instance of hafting during the Ashulian? Um, not as far as I'm aware of. I mean, this is, that immediately becomes a global question. Um, And I think you, the only thing that springs to mind perhaps is the focus on blade production argued to go back to 500,000 years ago at Kathupan in Southern Africa. 
Um, and I think they also have some younger, younger points argue to have distal impact fractures, which they associate with that tools that can only be produce those particular uh, use where patterns from being halfed as tools, although as far as I'm aware, there is some debate about those. You know, obviously at the same time as the Acheulean, you, know, you do have very rare elements of organic technology, such as uh, you know, spears, uh, wooden spears, but purely wooden spears from 400,000 years ago. As far as I'm aware, I don't think there's any really, anything really robust showing that Acheulean populations definitely half to their tools. And this is where kind of repeatedly and in different places around the world, you see such a change with the middle Paleolithic. And it's repeatedly associated with this question of halfing. Um, and embedded with this is some of these changes with uh, what you need to do, produce Laval wild toolkits as well. The idea is that you have uh, more elongate, more complicated and hierarchical schemes of material activity. Thank you so much. So lots of thank yous again. Uh, Dr. Pat Chohan says, thank you, Speaking Archaeologically, for organizing this insightful talk. Thank you, Dr. Chohan, for coming in. Um, another thank you by Mr. Jaipal Jadeja. He says, interesting talk. Thank you for the webinar. Thank you so much for coming in. Uh, we have one last question by Ankita Ghosh from the Department of Anthropology, Punjab University. She says, uh, thank you so much for this enlightening session. In the article on middle late Paleolithic surface sites, occurring on dated sediment formations in the Thar Desert. You mentioned that the results of the survey presented the first dated evidence for upper Paleolithic occupations in central Thar region indicated the occurrence of lithic assemblages. Could you shed some light on how these assemblages offer insights into the regional trajectory of technological development from middle to late Paleolithic industries in the Thar Desert from the context of climatic amelioration and population expansions? Yeah, I mean, so with that study, there's really uh, piggybacking on some work that's been done over a number of years um, by a range of different groups dating uh, sediment formations. In particular, there's you know, an interest in examining the antiquity of the Thar Desert and also the antiquity of uh, sand dune mobility in the region. So what I was really trying to do there is say, okay, and this is work I undertook while I was a student. Um, there was no real opportunity to think about dating at the time. So what I was really doing is looking, okay, here are some dated sediment formations, which have been worked on by a purely paleo environmental team. Perhaps as an archeologist, I'm going to be able to identify the presence of stone tools that can be associated with these, these deposits. Um, now, I was very, I was particularly interested in a specific time frame, uh, particularly going from uh, around 40,000 years ago and before, uh, and which led me uh, entirely to find Middle Paleolithic toolkits. Um, so in, in that sense, there wasn't a lot that I can say directly about the appearance of the late Paleolithic. But what I could identify is that there is some evolution within the Middle Paleolithic and between the older and younger elements. And that was evident in terms of changing sizes of toolkits, uh, changing changes in raw material use. So tools were, get, were being made to a smaller size, they were being made out of finer materials. Um, and then also the increasing frequency of alternate types and particularly our stress in the this youngest uh, assemblage I found of having blade technology but representing both Lavawa and non Lavawa blade approaches. So thinking about how we might see an evolution beyond that, well, you have this appearance of Lavawa blade production tied quite nicely with other Lavawa strategies, but then also people are experimenting with new ways of making blades. So again, for me, repeatedly, I see some of those key elements that feature in the late Paleolithic are often nested and embedded in the early middle Paleolithic. And for me, that supports the idea that you have a local innovation of these things here. 
And thank you so much. With that, we've reached the end of the discussion. And I hope everybody had just as great a time as I did moderating the session for all of you. Thank you so much, everybody, for tuning in. And I'm particularly thankful to Dr. Parth Chauhan from Aizu Mohali for coming in tonight at really a whirlwind invitation. I'd also like to thank Mr. Tony Joseph, author of Early Indians, the story of our ancestors and where we came from. Uh, he's come in for this talk very kindly, and I hope he's enjoyed the session. Thank you, everybody who's come in from a lot of different universities, and I hope the session has been worth your while. But above all, thank you, Dr. Blinkhorn, for accepting the invite to speak at Speaking Archaeologically, and I hope that you've had a great time talking to all these people from different parts of India. Um, I hope the session and the discussion that followed really gave you some very good questions to probably discuss more about your work with. And we look forward to seeing you again, hopefully to discuss your project in West Africa. So whenever you have the time, do consider coming back to us and talking to us about Because like I told you, we all follow your work extensively here at Speaking Archaeologically. Yeah, well, I mean, thank you again, everyone, for um, some really engaging, uh, really good questions in terms of cutting, cutting straight to some of the, those key topics, which I think are relevant for Paleolithic research across the world, but are particularly uh, relevant to what's going on in South Asia today. And I really hope that, uh, particularly towards the end of the talk, I was trying to pitch that, look, there are some really engaging questions that I think we can uniquely tackle by working with the South Asian record. Um, and yeah, thank you very, thank you for the invitation to talk. I'd love to come back and talk to your group again. Thank you once again, Dr. Blinkhorn. It was an absolute honor and a pleasure hosting you here.